thank you that by the unction of your spirit, you enable me to be able to speak the word that you would have spoken here today. Lord, I thank you that as the psalmist said, that you've given me the tongue as of a ready writer. I thank you, Lord, that you help me to say what should be and help me not to say what shouldn't be. I thank you, Lord, that when the people hear me, they'll hear you and not me. That in your great anointing and grace, that I will fade into the, pa uh, the background and you will come forward as the blessing that you are to each and every one. And Lord, as always, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can agree with that, say amen. <clears throat> last week I began to share with you on the subject of casting our cares upon the Lord. And like I said to you last week, I don't want to just simply teach another sermon about casting your cares on the Lord. I have in my heart to teach a message, yes, but more importantly, also to have the opportunity to put into practice what we learn from the Word of God. How many of you know that it's, it's real easy to turn on the radio, the TV, or whatever, and someone preach a message to you, and it's a good message, don't get me wrong, but there's really not much there that tells you exactly how to do it. I want you to know how to cast your cares on the Lord, and I actually want you to cast your cares on the Lord. And so my heart is to not just simply teach it as a message, but to also for us to participate in it as a, as a lifestyle, as a, as a living action on our part. And so with that in mind, that, that's the direction I'm going to take today. You'll also notice that the communion table is set and we'll be partaking of the Lord's table today towards the end of our service. Uh, you might be wondering, well, how do those two fit together? I'll tell you what, they fit together perfectly. And you'll understand as we get closer to the end of the service. So let us go to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 Peter 5, 7. I know some of you bring your Bibles, some use your phones, tablets, and then some of you just look at the screen. Whatever works for you, that's good, just as long as it works. But look there at 1 Peter 5, 7. Peter, writing by the inspiration of the Lord, said, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, not all of you were here last Sunday, so I'm going to give you some, uh, uh, bring you in on the subject and then remind the rest of you while I'm doing that. Remember that the word care there comes from the Greek text, and that word is translated not only as cares, but concerns, worries, fretting, anxieties, weights, stress, troubles, and busyness. That's a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? I don't know about you, that, but that sure covers a whole lot. I mean, what if we just said, you know, casting your cares and just left it there? Well, you'd be like, okay, you know, and then you kind of figure it out in your head what you think that word cares talking about. Or if we went this way and said, well, just cast everything that you worry about on the Lord. And, and then we're like, okay, well, we, we start thinking about what we're worrying about. But we as people, and don't take this wrong, I don't mean to offend anyone, but we as people play a word game. And we say, well, I'm not worried about it, I'm just concerned. Right? You ever said that or heard someone say that? Sure, sure, sure. Well, what's that mean? We're worrying about it. It's just like hate, you know, we know well, you're not supposed to hate people. Well, I don't hate them, I just don't like them. I just really don't like that person. Well, look up the dictionary of what the word hate means. It says a strong dislike. Boy, that just really kind of gives you a good nudge there, doesn't it? But that's what we do as people. We don't, we, you know, it's not because we're bad or evil or anything like that. It's just that that's just the way we've been trained in our society, growing up and so forth. It's just the way that we're conditioned, if you will. But, you know, when we come into the light of the word of truth, of God's word, you don't get that wiggle room anymore because God just says it like it is. It's all black and white with the Lord. You know, people say, well, you know, not everything's black and white. Well, go tell God it's not. Because he sees it all clearly. It's complete. There, there's no line. It's just great. No, that might work for you, but I got news for you. It's not true. Amen. And so we see here that this word cares, and not only means that, but also, as I said to you, the concerns and worry. I, you know, there's two words that stood out there to me that I thought was really interesting. One of them was stress. Anybody ever get stressed? Man, I am so stressed out. I just don't know what to do, right? Well, that's fretting. That's worrying. That's that's that care that he's talking about. You might not think of it that way, but that's what God's talking about here in his word. And the other one is busyness. Anybody ever get busy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I, I have to guard myself because I'm one of those guys that can easily slide into that workaholic thing. You know what I mean? Especially as a preacher, I can justify it because I'm serving the Lord and I'm serving you folks. So after all, it doesn't matter how much time I put into it. But you know, you can get so busy that that actually wears you down. It works against you. Amen. 
Also, remember that I shared with you that this word care comes from a Greek word that means to divide. Divide. So in other words, what happens is, is that when we get anxiety in our life, when we have cares, we have those frustrations, those, that, that, that fussing and that, that stress and everything, what that is doing is it's causing division in our life. It can actually cause division in you personally. Division between your heart and your head. Because in your heart, you may be trying to trust the Lord, but in your head, you're already going 100 miles an hour. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? And then it can cause uh, division between you and a loved one. I mean, after all, you're stressing out and they're just chilling out. How many of you remember the story of Mary, Mary and Martha, right? Mar uh, Mary's at the foot of Jesus listening to the word of the Lord and Martha's all scrambled about trying to make ready everything. Amen. How many of you know you can be the one that's stressing and the other one's just taking it easy, you know? I, I love it that when you're stressed out, the other person says, just chill out. Right? And then not only that, but we have this mentality in our life, in our society, that if a person cares, listen closely, if they care, they're going to automatically worry. Right? Just like Martha comes out to Jesus, she says, Lord, don't you care? Yeah. Well, you know, you just don't care. Well, if you cared... It'd be obvious you care, but it's obvious you don't care because look at you, you just, you know, you just don't give a rip. Right? But that's not always true. Look at the scripture there. It says, casting all your cares upon him for he careth for you. Right? Well, wait a minute. If we're supposed to cast our cares, if it's God's word that we're not to have cares, after all, Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 6, he says, take no thought for the morrow. He's talking about worry, and he's talking about how that uh, anxiety, worry, cares, and all that is it starts with a thought. And he says, don't take a thought for tomorrow, I meaning don't take an anxious thought for tomorrow, right? So here we are, you know, it's like, wait a minute. If we're not supposed to care or have cares like that, anxieties, then how is it right for God to have anxieties? Well, that's not that word care is talking about. That word care is talking about like a shepherd cares for a sheep. It's talking about how we tend to things and, and, and so forth. That's why the Bible says in uh, uh, Proverbs that he'll perfect those things that concern you and so forth. And so, so you have to understand, you can care without being anxious. You can care without stressing out. It's just that we've equated them two to, as one, and we think that if someone's not stressing out like we are, they don't care. Remember that when the disciples were in the boat and it was filling up with water and they're freaking out and Jesus is taking a nap. And says so they woke him up and said, Lord, don't you care? Well, of course he cared. But he wasn't all anxious about it, was it? He wasn't all stressed out. You know, I, I, I have a good imagination, you know, and it's probably not biblically accurate, but I can just see those guys, you know, I doubt they had a bucket or something in the boat to, to get the water out, but maybe they did, but I can see all these guys in there, you know, the, the rain's coming down, the wind's are blowing, the thing's filling up with water, and they're all doing this thing, you know, trying to splash the water out somehow, stressing out because it's just getting fuller and fuller and fuller, and there's, there's Jesus just sleeping away. How could he sleep in the first place? Did you ever think about that one? You got a raging storm that's about to fill the boat with water, and the guys take a nap. You mean there was no thunder? Of course there was. You mean there was no lightning? Of course there was. And he's sleeping. You know what would have happened? The first bolt of lightning. Man, I would be like, what? What's going on here? But not Jesus. Why? Because he didn't have that kind of care. He cared, but he did not anxiously care. Did you get that? And so you and I need to know that the, uh, the Scripture tells us that this anxious caring, or better yet, worry, does things to us. It stresses us out. How many studies have we heard about where they've studied the subject of stress and what all it does to us physically alone? or even emotionally. Think about the burden of stress and what it does to people. And then we also saw from the parable of the sower how that Jesus said that worry chokes the Word of God out of our life. 
Again, let's not play the word game. Just put it all together and accept it as so. When you're stressed out, it's choking the word. When you're too busy, it's choking the word. Amen. In Luke chapter 21 and verse 34, remember I shared this with you last week. Jesus was talking about the end times. And he said that the cares can weigh our hearts down. Weigh our hearts down. What's that mean? In other words, it can cause you to get depressed. You can have a tough time with these cares, worries, anxieties, and so forth. Worry can cause depression. I dare say, I think that a lot of the depression we see in our society today has a lot to do with anxiety uh, as far as the cares, that, that anxious caring that people have. Along with it, the idea that you're supposed to have that care, otherwise something's wrong with you. I mean, after all, you got to care, don't you? Did you catch that? All right. Notice again the ending of 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, for he cares for you. The answer to our casting our cares upon the Lord, and especially doing it once and for all like the Amplified Bible tells us to do, is in these simple words, he cares for you for you. I got news for you. Jesus is not anxiously caring for you and I. He's not stressing out one bit, never did, never will. But he tenderly and affectionately cares about each and every one of us. We meant so much to him that he was willing to leave heaven. We mean so much to him that he was willing to hang on that horrible cross. We mean so much to him that he was willing to die that death. And you know, if that was the end of the story, it'd be quite a story, but it's not. He actually went to the bowels of hell because he loves us that much. Amen. See, we need to understand that Jesus cares for us. Matter of fact, in the uh, English translation, it says, for he cares for you. That word, for he cares, is actually from a Greek word that means because. That's what it literally means. We could say it this way, because he cares for you. Because. How many times you ever had a conversation with somebody and they just stood there with you and kept saying, because. Right? Because. Because why? Because I said so. Right? Whatever it might be. Well, we ought to look at this this way. Because. Because why? Because he cares. He really does. Because he cares for you and I. Amen. See, we need to settle some things in our hearts and minds. And one of those is that God really truly loves us and cares for us. In Matthew 22 and verse 16, there were some disciples sent from the Pharisees with the Herodians, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God and truth. Nor, watch this, nor do you care about anyone. What an insult. See, because Jesus wasn't teaching it the way they wanted it taught, because he wasn't responding the way they wanted him to respond, he did not, he did not care. See, that's what I call performance-based relationships. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you know we can have a relationship with someone and it's strictly based on our performance? If we do what they want us to do, we sound the way they want us to sound and all that, we measure up, you're my friend. But if you don't measure up, you're not my friend. That's a performance-based relationship. But isn't it wonderful to know that our relationship with God is a grace-based relationship? It was something he decided before any of us ever got right, much less left. Amen. He, he extended his grace to us long before we ever breathed our first breath. Amen. Our relationship with God is grace-based. But here are these guys, and they're totally performance-based in their life. They, everything has to be measured by what they do and all that. Their relationships, their worship, everything is all measured by their performance. And they said to Jesus, you don't care. All because he didn't perform the way they wanted him to. Well, I got news for you. Jesus cares for everybody. Matter of fact, like I said before, he demonstrated it and what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection for us. I'm convinced that one of the best uh, scripture passages that helps you and I to see, know, and understand just how much Jesus really cares for us is in the uh, Good Shepherd there in John 10. If you have your Bible, turn there with me to John 10 and verse 11. Jesus talking to the people, he said, I am the Good Shepherd. Amen. Thank you, Lord, you are. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but the hireling, he who does 
is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and, watch, does not care about the sheep. Hmm. I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus has proven his love, his care, for each and every one of us. He proved it in his actions, in his words and in his actions. Jesus has done everything he said he would do. And Jesus has taken care of the wolf once and for all, for all of us. That's why the Bible tells us he's already defeated the devil. See, when you and I understand that, that helps us in life as well. Go with me to Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us a few things? Some things. Just what you got to have to get by. Just enough. Nope, that's religion. Give us what? All things. All things. See, if God did not spare his own son, our Lord Jesus, and Jesus himself was willing not to, to, to forsake us, he was willing to leave heaven and come to the earth and to redeem us. I mean, think about it. If God the Father was willing to send his son like that, and Jesus was willing to come like that, and did what he did in his death, burial, resurrection, in his redemptive work for us, how could any of us look at him and say, Lord, you just don't care? Obviously he cares. Who else has ever cared that much for you? Who else has ever gone that far for you? Who else has ever done that much for you? It is without question God does genuinely and truly care for us, lovingly and tenderly. So how do we cast our cares upon the Lord? I want to give you some simple steps on casting our cares on the Lord. If you're not taking notes, you can always watch this on YouTube as well because we put it on there. But you need to know these simple steps. This is nothing complicated. How many of you know it's real simple? You got to keep it simple. How many of you know that salvation is simple as the day we got saved? Faith is always as simple as the day we... It, keep it simple, people. The moment we complicate it, we've got it out of whack. We've, we've got... It's off track somehow. So let's keep it simple. First thing is, is that we need to truly settle within our hearts that the Lord is who he says he is. We go around here saying God is a good God. Well, I hope we really mean that. Because if he's a good God, he's not a bad God. And that means a good God does good things. Amen. Then we settle within our hearts that he really does care about us like a shepherd cares for his sheep. To the point that he sacrificed his own life. We settle within our hearts. Notice I keep saying heart. Because our head will go different ways on us. But we need to have a settled heart. We need to have our hearts established. Because I got news for you. You can, you can be purposeful in heart. And zigzagging in your head. But you got to stay with your heart. Amen. So we need to settle in our heart. That the Lord will truly perfect those things that concern us. Just like he said he would in his word. We have to with confident trust cast our cares or surrender our cares or better yet just simply entrust them to his care let him take care of it just give it to him and let him take care of it then we continue in faith and trust knowing that he will take care of it whatever it is and if check this out if we need to do something he'll tell us he'll show us and if we don't need to do something he'll tell us or show us because that's the biggest mistake we make after we've given our cares to the Lord. We decide God needs help. When it's really us that needs help. So we start trying to figure out, right? Okay, Lord, I give you my care. I give this care, this anxiety, this concern. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to entrust it to you. And I'm going to thank you, Lord, that you got it. You're going to take care of it. That's wonderful. I wonder what I should be doing about that. Because we can't really imagine the idea is true that it's nothing we're not even supposed to be thinking about it did you know that Jesus said take no thought 
Yeah. Can you? That's a mind boggler, isn't it? What do you mean I can't think about it? Hey, I'm going to think about it even if I don't want to think about it. Right? Because you know the enemy is going to help you think about it. I mean, even you're like, yes, Lord, I'm not going to, I, I choose not to think about it. And as soon as you say that, the devil's, bing, got it right there in your head, right? It just means that we don't keep it or dwell on it or let it take shape and form in our imagination. We keep resisting it and continue to trust God. We deliberately choose to guard our thoughts. We refuse to take that thought of worry and anxiety. We choose to think on God's word that assures us that God is who he said he is and his word is true and he is doing exactly what he said he would do. Sometimes we think God is too slow. You're right, Lord. Pretty much all the time we think God's too slow. But God is never late. Never has been and never will be. Like Paul and Silas when they were in that prison, we sing praises to the Lord and we let God do the shaking. Then we, when it's done, when God has taken care of it for us, we rejoice in the Lord and we share the testimony of God's faithfulness with others because it will help them to encourage to do the same thing. See, these are basic principles that you and I need to follow in casting our cares upon the Lord. Let me just share this with you in, 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 in just a moment here about casting our cares. Let's just look at it from a real practical standpoint. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, he says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So the example here is worrying about food and clothing. So let's use that. Did you? Yes, sir. Did you know that if you can cast your care on the Lord about what you're going to eat, you can cast any other care that you have on the Lord. Because the principles and steps that you use to cast your care about food on the Lord is the same principles and steps you use to cast your care of your children, of your money, of your life upon the Lord. Isn't that cool? I love how Jesus is so awesome. He just simply took it down to food and clothes. I mean, after all. Can we truly trust God to provide for us to eat? I remember he fed a prophet with a raven. I remember he provided manna like the dew on the ground. I remember he actually caused water to flow out of a rock. I don't know about you, but I don't care how hard or how many times or how many rocks I've struck, I've never seen water come out of them. But then I didn't need it at that moment either, did I? You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. See, we need to just simply use this as an example so it helps us to learn these simple truths. Okay, now wait a minute. Do we really, really, truly believe that God is God? Yes. Do we believe that he is true to his word, that what he said is true? We can take it to the bank, as they say. It is true without question. Mm -hmm. Did he say that he would provide for us? Yes, he did. Did he say that he would care for us? Yes, he did. Do we really believe that he will even provide our food for us? Now, I'm not talking about sitting on your couch watching the soap operas and looking for God to bring it by meals on wheels kind of thing. You know what I mean? How many of you know we got to do our part? How many of you know God provided quail, but they still had to get the quail? He brought it down where they could reach up and just grab it, but they still had to reach up and grab it. I mean, you know, he provided uh, manna on the ground, but they still had to go and pick it up. We got our part to play, all right? So don't, don't take that to a place it shouldn't be. Amen. So we believe that he will actually take care of us, all right. Will he provide food for me? Absolutely. No question about it. 
well then I can easily take my concern, my anxiety, my worry, my fretting that I might have about the provision of food in my life, and I can just simply say, hey God, man, I, I'm going to trust you, Lord. I know you love me. I know you care about me. I know you won't withhold anything from me, and I know that you will provide even my very food. So thank you, Lord, for providing food. And you know what? I don't have to think about it anymore. I don't have to fret about it or anything like that. I know he's going to take care of it. Yeah. Same thing's true with clothing. Same thing's true with every area of our life. Now, the devil does a head trip to us. He tries to tell us that when it comes to family, it's totally different. Like as if there's got to be something supernatural, spectacular, and all, you know, kind of thing. I got news for you. Casting the care of your children on the Lord is just as simple as casting the care of food on the Lord. It's just the enemy that makes us think it's something bigger or something worse or something harder. And it's not. It's the same principles. It's the same steps. He really does care for us. He will provide for us. And we confidently surrender with trusting uh, hearts that he will take care of those things that concern us. We continue in faith knowing he will provide. And he always will. Listen, if God can multiply fish and loaves, he can multiply what you have. I remember when I first came back to the Lord and started living for the Lord, I heard a lady tell the story about how they were uh, uh, having company over at their house. They, they invited some people from church to come over and have spaghetti with them. And, and they didn't really, they just, they thought they had just enough for their family and this other family that was coming over. And so while they're, they're cooking the spaghetti, they're like, thank you, Lord, this will be more than enough for everyone who sits at the table. And then wouldn't you know, the doorbell rings. And now it's another family. Hey, you know, and it's a large family. And so now they go back there to their pot of noodles that it's cooking. And they're like, thank you, Lord, you multiplied fish and loaves. You can multiply this as well. And they didn't bother trying to measure it out or anything like that. They just started scooping the noodles out when it was time. And you know what? Everybody had more than enough to eat, and there were noodles left over. Folks, God's still God today. He still does wonderful things today. Let's not limit him. Not, let's not let the enemy use worry to limit our faith or to limit God's intervention or help in our life. Amen? Now, let us bring this together full circle now concerning how this uh, 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 comes into the table of the Lord. Because see, when we look at the table, we might think, well, how's casting our cares have anything to do with the table? It has a lot to do with the table. Because see, the table reminds us that God is real. The table reminds us that Jesus truly came to this earth. The table reminds us that Jesus actually laid down his life for us. The table reminds us that God made a provision for us through his redemptive work. The table reminds us that truly, as the scripture says, my God shall supply your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not according to the U.S. economy. Not according to the politics of the nation. But according to his riches and glory. Amen. See, the table reminds us of his sacrifice to pay the price to provide the provision of salvation and all of our needs. It reminds us just how much he really truly cared about us and still does. It shows us and reminds us that health and healing are God's will. Hello. Health and healing are God's will for each and every person. And they are just as much a part of God's will for each and every person as forgiveness of sin is for each and every one. Amen. See, when you look at the redemptive work of Christ, you cannot separate health and healing from uh, forgiveness of sin. Many times people want to just talk about the forgiveness of sin. They want to ignore the subject of health and healing. But you cannot do that because Jesus offered up his very body to be brutally beaten in order to fulfill the scriptures that says, by his stripes ye were healed. If there is forgiveness, there is health and healing. 
It's all together. It's a package deal. Let me ask you this. If they are two different things, then why is there bread at his table? Let that soak in. You cannot participate at the Lord's table and it be complete unless you have the bread and the juice. So how can you say that it's only one or the other when it truly is both? The table reminds us that God did not spare Christ and that Christ did not refuse to come. The table reminds us that if God was willing to do all this for us, then surely he will take care of those things that concern us. And we can confidently surrender, give over, and entrust those things to him, knowing that he will take care of it. We may not know how. We may not know when. We may not know the particulars, but at least we know him. And we know he is faithful. Yes, sir. I sense the Spirit of the Lord steering in my spirit right here and now to tell you this. There are those of you sitting here in my midst right now. You are anxious and worried about family members. But I can boldly tell you and I can confidently tell you God is dealing with each and every one of them. So don't be moved by what you see. Don't be moved by what you hear. You continue to stay steadfast in the Lord and you watch God work. Because you know what? All you have to do is look around and you'll find someone that someone else would have swore would have never came to the kingdom. And here we are. There's plenty of misfits toys in this island, if you will. But we are not misfits anymore. I'm telling you by the Spirit of the Lord, there's no one beyond his reach. No one. Trust him. Trust him. He will take care of them. He will take care of them. God is bigger than a dodge. I mean, remember I shared that with you years, uh, a month ago. God's bigger. I don't have a little God. I don't have a God that fits in a box. I don't have a God that fits everybody's theology. I have a God who I have the awesome privilege to call Father, who is the creator of heaven and earth, ruler of the universe, and submits to no one, but reigns over all. We can cast our cares upon Him. Today, as we partake of the Lord's table, not only do I want to admonish you to receive health and healing in your bodies if you are ill. Not only do I want to encourage you to receive forgiveness if you need forgiveness in your life. Not only do I want to encourage you to embrace the righteousness of God that God has made and us to be and given it to us. But I also want to encourage you to know that just as sure as that price was paid, that provision was made, that God will take care of those things. So let's cast our cares on the Lord as we partake of this table today. Before we actually partake of this table, I want to give opportunity to anyone to receive Christ as their Savior. If there's anybody here that's never accepted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, I want to pray with you so that you can do so. It may be that everybody in this room is born again, and if you are, that's wonderful. It may be that there's someone here today with us that has gotten away from their relationship with uh, Christ. They've wandered away and they need to come back home like that prodigal. I want to pray with you. It may be that there's someone here today that God is just stirring your heart and you know, man, I just need to make a greater commitment of myself and my life to God. I know I'm right with the Lord. I know God loves me, but I mean, I just know that God is stirring me to make a greater commitment of my life to Him, to really give more of myself to Him. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes at this time. And if there's anybody here, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, and you know today is that day. This is the moment you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want you to just lift up your hand so I know that there's someone that applies to. And I'm going to pray with you. I'm not going to ask you to come up here in front or anything like that. I know some people do that, but that's not the way I do it. I'm just going to pray a prayer out loud and ask you to say it after me with everybody else saying it. 
and be sincere. And if you do, God will hear you and answer you. Matter of fact, that's the way I'm going to pray today for anyone who needs to accept Christ or to rededicate their life to the Lord or, or, or to uh, uh, come back home. So, again, anyone here that's not accepted Christ as their Savior and would like to with the upraised hand, I, I'm looking for anyone that that might apply to. All right. How about the one who's wandered away from home like that prodigal we read in the book of Luke? And you know you need to come back home. You need to make things right with the Father God. You need to come on home, as we say. Is there anybody that that would apply to? Raise your hand. Looking for any hands this morning. All right. How about that third and last one that I offered? And that was the just, you know, God's just dealing with you just to make a greater commitment of your life to Him. Is there anybody that that would apply to? Thank you for that hand. Anyone else? Thank you for that. Now, I'm going to pray that uh, prayer, and I'm just going to ask you to say it after me. Just be sincere in your heart before the Lord. And, of course, I want everybody to pray it out loud. And if you didn't raise your hand and should have, you just go ahead and pray it sincerely. God will hear you as well, all right? So let's pray this prayer to, uh, uh, sincerely to the Lord. Heavenly Father, come on, say it out loud. Heavenly Father, I believe that you are stirring my heart today to make a greater commitment of my life to you. So Lord, I surrender myself to you and I choose to make a greater commitment of myself and my life to you. Be Lord in every area and over everything. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to ask